Well, hello, firefighters, and it's good to be with you. And it, it is great to have such a kind introduction from your president, a man I greatly admire. You know, we have a lot of international presidents who have homes in Virginia. They come from all over the country, but because of presence in D.C., they have a significant uh, Virginia tie. But Harold is a president that is a Virginian, and we claim him having come up through Fairfax County, our largest system. So uh, give, just give him a great round of applause for all the good work he does. We're so proud of him. Harold goes back a ways with my family. My father was the first Republican governor of Virginia, my father-in-law, elected in 1969. And when he was governor, he helped the firefighters in Virginia get the heart-lung presumption put as part of Virginia law, working with this very young firefighter and local leader from Fairfax County. And uh, I, I think part of the reason that Harold's been nice to me is because my father-in-law is such a good guy. But I'll take it any way I can Sign get it. That Sign that bill. Um, listen, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, policy priorities and the state of American politics in a contentious presidential year. But first, let me tell you about my tie to you as firefighters and also my tie to organized labor. Um, I grew up in a labor household. My dad ran a, an iron worker organized welding shop in the stockyards of Kansas City. He was the owner in management. Um, he had five employees in a tough year and seven employees in a good year, but it was an iron worker organized shop and my father taught my brothers and me and my mother, because we all worked in the business, that things worked when you cooperated. And that cooperation between management and the, work, the workers or labor was not something that was rare or unique or something that you could do one day a year like on Labor Day, but it was an everyday thing. And when there was cooperation and, uh, and collaboration, everything went better for everybody. That's how I came up, and that's why when I got into politics in Richmond in 1994, running for city council, I worked very, very hard, and I have worked throughout my career to have strong labor support. Um, Harold was right. The firefighters have been with me every step along the way, save my first step. And there's a good story there. When I ran for the city council in Richmond, I ran against an incumbent who was good. He was a popular incumbent with the Richmond firefighters. We had a sizable municipal firefighting operation. And when you have an incumbent who's watching out for you, obviously, you want to help that incumbent out. So I've been in eight races in my life, and the only one where I didn't have the support of the firefighters was the first. But after I eked out a 92-vote win in my first race in 1994, I pulled Dave Pulliam, who many of you know, who was our great Richmond firefighter guy for many years before he passed away, into my office and I said, I can understand why you supported my opponent and that was the right thing to do, but I'm going to be your go-to guy and there's not going to be any question in future races that you're going to want to support me. And as a city councilman and then mayor in Richmond, I worked very, very closely with our firefighters around a whole series of issues from working conditions and salaries, but also to significant adjustments and improvements to our local pension system so that our firefighters would have the kind of dignified retirement that they deserved. Um, it just seemed right, it just seemed fair, and it wasn't that hard to do because my citizens wanted me to do that because they also understood the sacrifice that firefighters make. I took that then for eight years into state government as a lieutenant governor and governor where I worked not just with the Richmond firefighters but firefighters all over the state to advance priorities that were important but also stand shoulder to shoulder in challenges, including the challenges of losing firefighters, which every year we have a commemoration at the state fairgrounds in Richmond where we gather together to remember members of the firefighting community that have passed. And now it's my pleasure to take that local and state advocacy into the Senate and to stand with you. Harold talked about some of the things I've stood with you on. I believe strongly in collective bargaining. It is, uh, it's just... It's workplace democracy, you know? So if you support democracy, why wouldn't you support workplace democracy? I was one of the uh, co-sponsors of the 9-11 Health and Compensation Reauthorization Act, and that eventually got over the hump with some spectacular on-the-hill advocacy by firefighter and first responder community, uh, but nobody had to come and ask me to be a sponsor because I saw it and said, look, this is a commitment that we've made. We've got to, we've got to keep it. I've worked hard to make sure that the Senate funds fire and safer grant programs because I've seen as a local and state official 
how important these programs are to the public safety work that you do and to the cell, uh, health and safety of my commonwealth and my city. Last year, when we were in jeopardy, it's hard to believe this, it sounds like I'm making this up, when we came within 24 hours of the Department of Homeland Security going out of business because we couldn't reach an agreement on funding, I was standing strong with all of you in making sure that we could fund DHS so that these grants and the critical public safety mission would be supported. So I, I you know, in the past we've been together, and I know there's going to be a lot more issues on the table, but I do want you to know you can count on me and I'm going to look forward to working together with you for years and years and years to come. Let me, let me, um, let me now say a word about the current political climate. Virginia is, a, is an interesting state. In presidential political years, frankly, Virginia was irrelevant for a very long time. And beginning in 2008, we kind of rocketed into relevance and now together with Ohio and Florida, Virginia is really viewed as one of the three battleground states. As my Virginia firefighters know in this room, we are thought to be almost the perfect bellwether. We're Democrat, Republican, Independent, kind of at the national average. We're rural, urban, suburban, kind of at the national average. The popular vote for President Obama in 2008 and 2012 was the closest match for the national popular vote margin. So Virginia is a state that is kind of now right on the stage with the spotlight on it when it comes to national politics. And watching my state transform from non-competitive to competitive, and then with the virtue of having been a national party chair for two and a half years, you know, I have a lot of observations about the 2016 election. First, I'm not past the point of being surprised. Let me just say that. You know, I've been in this since 1994. I should know everything and be able to predict everything by now, but I will say this campaign season has produced a number of surprises. It won't surprise you as a Democratic senator and a former DNC chair that I've got a strong favorite. I came out two plus years ago encouraging Secretary Clinton to run for president, but I will say this, as a guy who serves on a budget committee with Bernie Sanders, I'm proud of the campaigns that they're running because they're substantive, they're meaningful, they point out differences, but generally, and it's hard in, the, in a competition, I get this, I've been in races, it's hard, but generally, they're keeping it within the bounds of really fair debate about important issues. You don't, you know, they're not, they're not tweeting out negative things about each other's spouses and they're not doing some of the other things that we've seen on the other side. And I'm, I'm proud of my team for doing that. But one of the things I'll just say uh, and then conclude is a, uh, an editorial comment. I think America's great already. I really do believe that. You know, I, um, are we, are we perfect? No. Are there things to improve? Darn right there are. You know, uh, uh, um, Thomas Edison once said, discontent is the first sign of progress. If you don't have some discontent about something, then you're slacking and you're complacent and you're going to backslide. So you, you always have to be able to look in the mirror and find areas where you can be stronger. And there's nothing that we're doing that we can't do better. But when I hear the suggestion that we're not great, I'm like, you know, like what? What nation are you looking at? What reality are you living in? I, I'm on the Armed Services Committee uh, in the Senate. And, um, and not only am I a committee member, but I'm one of the parents of the 1.6 million young men and women who volunteer to serve their country. And so I spend an awful lot of time, my oldest son's an infantry commander in the Marine Corps, and I spend an awful lot of time as a committee member and a dad interacting with our active duty. And I see people who, in a time of war, 15 years of war, have volunteered to serve because of their great spirit of patriotism. And I visit them all over the world and I see the spirit that they have. And that is a great, great spirit uh, that, is, that is not only helping us be strong militarily, but then when folks exit the military and they go into civilian life, they bring with them all this leadership training and knowledge of the world that helps the entire society. As I travel around the world as a member of the Armed Services Committee to meet our, uh, uh, you know, our, our troops, and especially the ones from Virginia, I spend time talking to foreign leaders. And they repeatedly stress the greatness of our country. They want to do deals with us. They want to 
enter into treaties with us. Their people want to immigrate to the United States. They want to come and be Fulbright scholars or get academic scholarships here all around the world. Even when other nations are mad at us, they tend to be mad at us because they want more leadership out of us. When they look at us, they see a powerful example. I'll tell you uh, a story that was kind of an interesting one recently. Because I do a lot of work on the Middle East, I was in uh, Turkey and Jerusalem back to back in January. And uh, both the leaders of these countries, Jewish Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, Islamic Prime Minister, President uh, Erdogan of Turkey, both of them said, hey, kind of what's going on with the rhetoric in your presidential race? Now, those two don't agree on a lot. But what they agree on is we're the example. We're the North Star. We're a, we're a country where you can live in the same block and go to the same school and, and work together when you're from a different part of the world or you're from a different religion. And not that we're perfect, but we kind of make it work. And the world needs a North Star like us because those are nations that want to be more like us. They won't be less sectarian or maybe the same way we, built, we will be tomorrow, but they want to be more like us and they need us as a strong example. So I... Um, I stand here as a guy who's been in office for 22 years and a patriotic person who will always admit that everything we do, we can do better. But I, I think we are a great, great nation. I'm not in the blame America first crowd. I'm not in the talking down where we are crowd. I'm in the talking us up and then trying to find ways to make us even better. You're a key part of that. You know, you're here because you're leaders in every last community and every last city and county and every last zip code in the United States and you take what you learn in this convention back to lead in ways that are inspiring. You inspire me, you know, the, uh, every once in a while, this will not surprise Harold, there, I love my job, I'm a happy senator, but there are a lot of frustrations, especially after you've been a mayor and a governor, and then you come into the Senate, and you're 95th in seniority, and they put you in a basement office with no windows for six months, and there's a real seniority system in the United States Senate, believe me. But even with all of that, even with all of that, I love doing what I do because as I go out and I go around Virginia, I interact with folks, I see such cool examples of people taking lo local initiative to solve local problems and lead in ways that give me inspiration. So you keep inspiring us and we'll keep uh, the partnership strong and I look forward to a lot of good work together for Virginia and for America in years to come. Really appreciate your service and thanks for having me.